So, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, today I will speak about lubrication theory, more precisely about elasto hydrodynamic lubrication, and in particular about the beginning of the history of hydrodynamic lubrication, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication. But if I would like to find the very beginning, historical beginning, starting points of this area of research and engineering, then I would go even further back to the 1880s, and there were two points. One connected with elasto and one with hydro theory of elastic contacts and theory of hydrodynamic lubrication. And it is very interesting that both developments happened almost at once. 1882, Heinrich Hertz, who as a matter of fact was no, no contact mechanicist, but he published his famous I think the most important, the most famous work in the contact mechanics at all. Wonderful work. One can read it, of course, today. It's of highest level. Why Hertz did this work? Yeah, because he found analogy. He showed that some that the contact mechanical problem is equivalent to some problem in the potential theory of electrostatics, and he just took the solution out. Only three years later, Joseph Businesk published a very fundamental systematic research on contact mechanics based on the fundamental solution. He also found the solution for the um, flat-ended uh, cylindrical punch, for example, and many others. And almost at the same time, one year later than Hertz, the Russian military engineer Nikolai Petrov published a paper about hydrodynamic lubrication. It is also very fascinating, very interesting work, which is completely modern with yeah, it can be read and taught to the students today. And three years later, Reynolds published even better, didactically better, a little bit more general research, basically the same as Petrov, but, but better, about the hydrodynamic lubrication. And yeah, in the history, both names are known, but the fundamental equation is, which we all use in hydrodynamic lubrication, is the Reynolds equation. What happened in 1880, I do not know, but something should have happened because really the complete contact mechanics and hydrodynamic lubrication theory were accomplished practically in the contemporary state in, at once. I allow me to make a small introduction <laughs> into lubrication, and I follow the paper of Reynolds, and I use copies of his figures and the whole logic. He considers first two flat, rigid surfaces separated by a fluid and considers two modes, basic modes of motion, simple shear with a linear velocity profile and given by this equation linearly on the vertical coordinate and the squeezing approach. Then there is parabolic profile and the driving force is the pressure gradient. If you have arbitrary flow, it is superposition of approaching and sharing 
And then the solution is just sum of both. And this solution can be, can be used locally. So one can also you consider slowly changing gap, not parallel plates. And this is a figure, some number, the next figure from the paper of Reynolds. And then with this velocity profile, he considers incompressibility condition, the condition of mass conservation, and gets this equation, which we call Reynolds equation. Basically, it is mass conservation. There are two parts here and here, and these parts say, if we look in detail, that the volume which is coming due to approach should come outside due to flow. This is the Reynolds equation. <coughs> As we hear, sliding velocity, h is gap, eta is dynamic viscosity of the fluid. One point, there is one other point, maybe which is not so well known outside of the lubrication theory, and it is connected with cavitation. Because pure solution of Reynolds equation for symmetric bodies is symmetric. It is some part where it is flowing out and where it is flowing uh, from in and out and there is a positive and negative pressure, one can show that the integral of this pressure is exact zero. For macroscopically flat but some wavy surfaces, the net normal force is zero. And this means that the surfaces have no loading, load-bearing capacity, this official uh, term for this. This means that if we apply normal force, the liquid will be squeezed out. And of course, there is no lubrication. Then if there is no lubricant, there, this has to be. And this load-bearing capacity appears only due to cavitation. The classical of uh, hydrodynamic lubrication knew that fluid cannot bear negative pressures. It cavitates, and then the pressure in the region where it should have been negative is practically zero. Then the pressure distribution is non-symmetric and the integral is non-zero, so there should be cavitation. Otherwise, there is no lubrication. Now, back to the Reynolds equation. There is the general equation is two-dimensional, but if you look one-dimensional cylindrical, uh, symmetry, then it, is, it can, of course, be integrated in a general form. Here is the derivative, here is the derivative. The first integral is just trivial. Trivial, and there is, of course, an integration, integration constant, which is denoted here h naught. So we can call this equation, the Reynolds equation, it is very often in two dimensional, it is just starting point of, and we look uh, a little bit to this. If we would like to use it to determine the pressure distribution, then we have to have, it is differential equation, so we have to have boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions typically used in the lubrication theory is pressure on the left and out, on the outside the contact, left and right, is zero. On the one side it is zero because it is atmosphere, it is outside. Of course it is not zero but by, by the atmospheric pressure, but it is inside and outside, so we can just put it zero, there is no problem. And on the other side it is zero due to cavitation. There are two different reasons why it is zero, but on both sides it is zero. This means that the average gradient should be zero as it comes from the same value to the same value. And this is everything which one has to, do, to know about lubrication, hydrodynamic lubrication. Now, I try to use this for 
analyzing some simple situation. Take two parallel surfaces. This means gap is constant. This means gradient of pressure is constant. But as the average gradient is zero, this means that the gradient is zero. Gradient zero means the pressure is constant, but as pressure on one side is zero, it is zero. So there is no bearing capacity. The pressure is just zero inside this. It can be sheared, but no pressure appears. To, to the pressure, to create pressure, we have to, to make some change in the gap. For example, in this way, so it will be aquaplaning, and there is, will be a capacity. Or even simpler, one can make just a step. What's really suggested by Lord Rayleigh is famous Rayleigh step bearing. It works. It is a step, and if it is a step, this means that the gap is constant in one region, but it is constant in another region. So the gradient is constant in one region, the gradient is constant, but are there constant in the other region? But because it has to start by zero and end by zero, it has to be such triangle, to be triangle. And, and this means, of course, that there is capacity. The integral of this pressure distribution is non zero. Up to now, the bodies were rigid. But what if we take one of the bodies, make one of the bodies elastic? The simplest possibility is just to take such elastic sheet, or, or maybe it can also be any other elastic body. And in most cases, in, for example, in gears, the gap is so small that the changes of gap does not change the the deformations of the bodies, that means it does not influence the pressure distribution. The pressure distribution comes from elastic, uh, so one can make it even more pronounced in such a, such a situation that we, that we make some press stress with some springs, so then we have pressure distribution, but we have no gap. This means that this equation we can read in both sides. Normally, in the hydrodynamic lubrication of rigid bodies, we have H and get the pressure, but we can produce pressure and get the, the H, but if the body is not rigid, if it is elastic. The first scientist who considered this inversion of the Reynolds equation and considered the elastic bodies was a young Russian scientist. He was at the time student at the physical faculty of the Moscow State University. 1939, as he was, at that time he was 26 years old, so not very young, but, but still relatively young. He, for the first time, suggested to consider this elastohydrodynamic lubrication problem. So at this point, I would like to stop a little bit with, uh, with the physics and go to this young uh, man uh, with the name Ertl and tell a little bit about Ertl. So the name uh, Alexander Ertl, the Ertl comes from Wilhelm von Ertl. Wilhelm von Ertl, born in Wittenberg, studied in Leipzig, came to Russia 1815, later became Russian citizenship. He was 10 years personal teacher of the future Tsar Alexander II in German language. This was German family and at the time, and noble, he was noble, was no noble German uh, family. At the time when Alexander was born, 1913, in the family, one spoke still German. So later, when he escaped to Germany, he <laughs> already could speak well German. At that time, at that place, it was not very favorable 
to come from a noble family. It was four years before the October Revolution. This was the reason why he was refused enrollment to Moscow State University first. He was um, admitted later, but without fellowship, so he had to work. He, he earned his money with um, expedition, working at the expedition in the uh, Central Asia, and later by uh, assisting the academician Kapitza. Uh, I uh, think that, that you know who is Kapitza. He is very first of all known for, for his um, yeah, the discovery of the experimental discovery of the superfluidity of the fluid helium. But, <coughs> but in Russia, in the Soviet Union, he is more, even more famous because he was founder of the Institute of Physical Problems, where he gathered people like Landau and Lifshitz, Ginsburg, and because there are at least four or five Nobel Prizes which became the people from this institute founded by Kapitza. And uh, according to some sources, it was Kapitza who suggested to Ertl to work on this elastohydrodynamic problem. According to other sources, it was not. He was not. Uh, and Ertl just came himself on this idea. Nobody knows how it was in reality. So, this was this first paper, which Ertl wrote 1939, with 26 years. He presented it also on the famous seminar, Kapichnik, in the Institute of Physical Problems. And two years later, he graduated from the Moscow State University, from the physical faculty, 10 years after the beginning of the great patriotic work of the Russia against, of the Soviet Union against Germany. So the whole work which followed was during the war, and it ended against the end of the war. So he, he used uh, um, this, this time. He had luck to work, not to be sent somewhere to Siberia or or other, but he really worked at the Institute of Academy of Sciences under, in the theological department, uh, which head was Mikhail Khrushchev. Who was Mikhail Khrushchev? I think physicists maybe do not know very well. Tribologists do know, because abrasive wear, the law of abrasive wear, is Khrushchev's law. There is also the law of adhesive fear. This is Archer's law. So Khrushchev is, of course, a very uh, famous figure. And um, this was the department where he worked. And at the end of the war, Ertel presented his dissertation and internal report with the title, The Calculation of Hydrodynamic Lubrication of Moving Curved Surfaces Under High Load. It was accepted with a very great um, yeah, lope. Yeah. The Khrushchev wrote to, this, to the higher attestation commission who was responsible for awarding the, the degrees of candidate of science that this is a very exceptional work and all these questions which are handled in the work are theoretically exceedingly difficult and their successful solution serves witness of the extraordinary abilities of Ertl because of this, he asked to release him the candidate uh, exams, <laughs> just because he is so exceptionally, um, uh, because of his exceptional, exceptional uh, abilities. 
what exactly did Ethel in his work? He recognized and brought together several points, three points. First, if one has a heavy loaded contact, as in gears, then the viscosity is known to be function of pressure. Ethel used the simplest exponential law, Barrow's law. Alpha is pressure index very small, 10 to minus 6 Pascal to the minus first power. But if the pressure is 1 gigapascal, then the viscosity is extremely high. It is practically solid, no liquid anymore. And this dependence of the viscosity on the pressure should be taken into account. He used this law. The Reynolds equation is still valid. One just has to substitute here this exponential law. Then he brought the exponent on the other side. Then he has on the left side something which does depend only on the pressure. And one can rewrite this in, by introducing the reduced pressure in the form which has exactly the same shape as a normal Reynolds equation of the initial Reynolds equation for the pressure independent for the pressure independent viscosity only on the place of pressure now it is this reduced or reduced pressure everything is the same but everything is completely different because the pressure which is which does not depend on the, the, if the viscosity does not depend on pressure, then the pressure can get higher if we have, for example, the higher velocity, the sliding velocity. But if the reduced pressure becomes one divided by alpha, then the pressure becomes infinite. So it is this connection of the pressure and the reduced pressure is singular. The reduced pressure cannot be arbitrary. And this is a large change and a large difficult in reality, uh, or simplifying factor. Uh, Ertel understood that this is a matter, this complicated thing is in reality simplifying factor. This, is, this was the first thing which he understood, the importance of pressure dependence. The second one is the following. If the pressure is high, then this exponential term is zero. And the reduced pressure is constant. Constant and almost, not on the border, there will be something, but in almost in whole part of the conduct, it is constant. If the reduced pressure is constant, that means that the height, that the gap is constant. This is a constant gap, and this means that the shape of the body is the same as if it, if it is just elastic contact. So the pressure is, for example, the Hertzian pressure. As a matter of fact, one has not to use this constant, the constancy of the gap, because the gap is so small that even if it is not constant, the pressure is still Hertzian. But, but it is also constant. It is even more better. And this means that the gap is constant. Here, zero, the gap constant. And it is not just constant, but it is equal to this H dot naught. But what is H naught? There is no possibility to find H naught from this, uh, from these conditions which I'm, I talk about. For finding this, one has to go from outside to inside the contact, because this constancy of the of the reduced pressure is only inside, but outside it should be zero. So it should be some, some transition. Uh, and this was the third part, this transition. And the transition he considered in this, in this way. So the pressure is high inside. It is zero outside. So outside, it is practically, practically Hertz shape. He just took Hertz shape, took it as a, as a width of the gap, 
put it in the equation, integrated it, and then he got the equation. This was transition between outside and inside. It, it, this was the third important part of his work, and he got the dependence of the, of the gap, this constant gap, H0, and H0 is here inside, inside this equation. It is a complicated integral of complicated function. But one can numerically find this function, and then the problem is solved. Ertl had even luck. He had luck because numerical evaluation of this function showed that in double logarithmic uh, variables, it is practically exactly <laughs> so uh, li linear dependency, and this means that this is a power law which substituted then produced this gap. And th this gap is the only thing which is needed finally to find, for example, the tangential force. The bearing capacity is so, so is, is only the problem of elasticity, and the tangential force is the problem of this H0, and this is what he found, and he found then the, yeah, the frictional force, which is, uh, which appears in this elasto hydrodynamically lubricated contact. <coughs> there was fourth point which was important. As a first of all, let me say later, there were numerical solutions of this problem by Petrosevich, even later by Dawson and Hamrock, but they did not change anything essential. Here it is not 0.91, but better 0.1. And so all the, the powers are a little bit different from exact numerical calculations, but, but they are almost uh, those which were found initially by Ertl. Later, there was something, a little, a little change. But the important fact, important point, the fourth, is the following. Now, I saw there is transition between outside and inside on the in, inlet, on the f uh, yeah, inlet, where, where, is, where the lubricating comes into the contact. But what about outlet? Can we use the outlet? No, we cannot use because on the other side there is cavitation. There the pressure should become negative and it cannot become negative, there is cavitation. If it is, there is, if there is cavitation, then the Reynolds equation is not valid. We can use only, only in, on the one side the Reynolds equation, but not on the other. On the other, it is just cavitation. But what means cavitation in this case? It is very high pressure and then it is cavitation, it drops to, to zero. If the pressure drops to zero, it is like, yeah, it is, it is like cylindrical punch. And then one knows that elastic, that elastic pressure in, in this case uh, has a spike. It is initially, as a matter of fact, if, if it happens, sharply, then there is an infinitely large um, pressure. And this is what he also predicted. So he basically found all the parameters of the elastohydrodynamic pressure. That it is almost Hertzian, that it is not completely Hertzian, that there is almost constant central film, there is some, some decreasing at the outlet, and that there is this, this spike. Later, Petrusevich was the first who could calculate this numerically. In the way, in the exact the way which we do now. Elastic problem with boundary element, which we now call boundary element method, and Reynolds equation with some uh, finite differences. And he found numerically this distribution of pressure with spike and this distribution of the height. Um, that is why this spike is known as Petrusevich 
it's fine. <laughs> the two same HP of pressure. Later, one found the possibility to measure the pressure and the gap. And here, for example, I measured pressures and gap from a paper of 2003, both measured experimentally. Of course, they are very similar. All what, what predicted Ertel in his paper, or in, in his, his work, uh, was substantiated by later research. And finally, one could see the gap here by interference picture. Here is a constant gap. Here is in, uh, inflow, here is outflow, and here is this region for the ball. Ertl, of course, considered cylindrical, uh, not the point contact, but line contact. So this is a further development. And as a matter of fact, for the picture, for the announcement of this, uh, of this presentation, I used exactly this interference picture of the gap of a lubricated, uh, elastohydrodynamically lubricated contact. <coughs> the people who attended at the seminar were excited. Grubin was the head of laboratory where Ertl worked. He wrote in his statement, the level of this work approaches that of the classical works of the lubrication theory by Petrov, Reynolds, Hertz, etc. The value of this work is extraordinarily high and should bring the author scientific renown worldwide. As we know, it brought renown worldwide the name of Grubin. Because at that time, the theory was not published. It was an internal report of Timash. This is the title page. Here you see this reduced pressure and the Reynolds equation. Here are the uh, figures with the pressure distribution. This was during the war. You can see the quality of the paper used. And this was an internal report. It was not published. It was not known. But, of course, it was known in this laboratory. And this laboratory is very, very famous in the Soviet Union. It produced very many famous tribological names. <coughs> but none then, uh, due to his experience and due to uh, German language, Ertl was sent to Germany after the war, and he was he overtook the leadership of a laboratory on tribology in Berlin Pankow. He had some also some uh, official functions there, but after some time he escaped. One found his bike and clothes at the. Uh, at some Berlin lake, and yeah, it, it looks like it was some accident, and he is not alive anymore. In reality, he escaped, escaped to West Germany. He is portrayed at that time of 1946, already with, with the, his new name, because of course in West Germany he could not uh, use his identity, he, he took another name, he was then Alexander von Morenstein. And as in the Soviet Union, where he also had a wife and a daughter in Moscow, he was believed to be dead. He, his, he should start his, his work in the West Germany completely from the very beginning. He, his work in Moscow, however, was not forgotten. forgotten. It influenced the history of the tribology because his, the head of laboratory, Grubin, 
who predicted him so to be renowned, published this work, 1949, under his name, under his own name, without mentioning Ertel. There was very long discussion over many decades if Grubin, if it, it was correct for Grubin to publish this. But the people in Moscow find that it was correct because they could not use the name of Ertl at that time. They just could not use the name. And they either should not publish it at all or publish it under, under another name. And they preferred to publish it. Of course, the history is now known, but still the history cannot be changed and the inventor of the <laughs> last hydrodynamic theory is Grubin. For most of tribologists, 2017, during the World Tribology Congress in Beijing, there was an introductory video which also showed the main contributions of different scientists. World Tribology Congress, the inventors of elastohydrodynamic theory, Alexander Nikolaevich Grubin and Duncan Toms. I think this cannot be changed anymore, even if um, the, the authorship of uh, Ertl is of course known, he already also got the Egel, the, the Vogelpohl Ehrenzeichen in 18, uh, 18 uh, 1984, so it is known, but still the, the most people will think that it was uh, Grubin. Now, back to the uh, history of Ertl. After the war in West Germany, he first worked at the Institute for Machine Elements at the Technische Hochschule Braunschweig. After one year, 1947, he got his second PhD on what we now will, would call mixed lubrication, completely different topic, both theoretical and experimental. He then worked two years or three maybe years at the Max Planck Institute on quantum mechanics under Max von Lauer. And then he came to Freiburg and worked in theoretical physics at the University of Freiburg, where we are <laughs> now. And he lived also longer time here. I do not know exactly what I am during this time of the work at the University of Freiburg. He started his collaboration with Fuck Google Fisher in Eben. And according to some sources, um, it was very the, the marked leading position of this Google Fisher was really to 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 great extent due, due to his knowledge in the uh, in the lubrication uh, theory. Um, 1952 he submitted. 1956 he also got uh, the patent, the US patent for hydrodynamic um, bearing, which was produced and used very intensively by the Google Fisher. And this is practically exactly the same idea which he published very early in, already in the, his first paper in Soviet Union, but, but it was just publication later, it was implemented into industrial practice. This is practically the step bearing of relay, but an automatic one. The step bearing of relay is working only in one direction, and in the other direction it has no capacity, no loading capacity. But if one produces the pressure gradient 
with springs outside so that it is increasing and decreasing, then this bearing works in both directions and the gaps are changing according to the velocity. And it is, one can show that it is almost optimum, optimal, the, the minimum friction which can be produced at all in a bearing. It is very, very, very near to the, to the optimum. So this was uh, his further, he, he is, here is a photo of uh, Ertl with his colleagues in Ebern, but regrettably, uh, 1959, I think, during uh, his way from Ebern home to Freiburg, he was involved in a severe car accident. He was, he could not, uh, the half of his body could not move anymore, and, um, yeah, and, as a matter of fact, he could not work. He worked a little bit, but complicated, uh, creative uh, work was not possible anymore. He even learned to, to work with, with his disease, but, yeah. but his scientific career was ended. This is a picture of 1961, five years later, he wrote a letter to Khrushchev, to the former head, at that time director of the institute. He writes, 20 years ago you knew me under the name of Ertl, and yeah, six months ago I met Dr. Cameron from whom I have received your address. I received also English translation from Grubin regarding the lubrication of curved surfaces. To my surprise, this paper was almost a complete word-for-word -word translation of my work, which I had prepared as a report. In Grubin's paper, there is no mention that the theory and calculations were conducted by me. I find this very indecent of him. However, should you see Grubin, tell him, that I have forgiven him. As I already said, on the other side, this was practically considered as a necessary, historical necessity to do in this way. So, 1984, Ertl, Morenstein Ertl, became the highest tribological <laughs> award and he died 2001. I regret very much that I did not go to him at the time when he was alive and did not spoke with him. I regret very much that I did not go and did not spoke with his wife, Erika. This was a young girl which I didn't 46 was 19 years old and who helped him to escape to West Germany and became later his wife. Of course, 2008, when he died, I was already six years head of this department in Berlin. At that time, I, I could go so many times to Bamberg, where they lived at that time, and to speak, but uh, regrettably, I did not this. But their relative, the son and the granddaughter, helped us very, very much. We went to Bamberg, to the la latest uh, house of Morenstein Ertl, and his son, Michael Morenstein, and granddaughter, two different, the German and the Moscow <laughs> so lines of his family, uh, had shown us very many, many things, because they have complete archive, family archive. All the, the certificates, which are more than 150 years old, all are in this archive. All the copies of dissertations, of statements, and so on and so on. So, before this, we could 
only have some parts of the tools, but now after this conversation, we had completely, completely, yeah, so fest, feste, uh, yeah, erkenntnis. Um, so as Michael um, said, we published this in a paper in Sam. As a matter of fact, we wanted to do it to the 100th anniversary. It was 2013, but we uh, did not manage to do this. So we submitted it at the beginning of 1914s and 1914s uh, in March and then uh, in April, April it appeared already. It is very easy to find in Google some Popova Erdl. <laughs> the first link will be this open access paper. Um, thank you very much for your attention.